Yo-ho is a Cree expression of awe or wonder. And you can see by looking around here what a perfect name for this park. It doesn't matter where you look. There are beautiful vistas, there are mountains, there are lakes. For more than 125 years, visitors have come to Yoho National Park to gaze at the park's stark peaks and towering waterfalls. But as the second oldest national park in Canada, park ecologists here face unique challenges. The native cutthroat trout is being crowded out by a species introduced to the park's lakes to attract more anglers. We've made a decision that we're not gonna let species go without a fight. And decades of forest fire suppression have led to a pine beetle infestation that requires dramatic action. The mature beetles go in here, they burrow under meat and lay eggs. In Yoho National Park, park managers must grapple with the legacy of more than 100 years of differing management strategies. In national parks, we're thinking bigger than just the humans that are here. We're thinking about the forests, we're thinking about the aquatics. It's a big juggling and balancing act. like a lot of mountain biking, there's a lot of mountain biking. Yeah! Yeah! It's not riding on paved ground. Yeah! It's more like on dirt, rocks. Or, or it can be on boards sometimes. Yeah, it's great. At age six, Jack Kalesh must be one of Yoho National Park's most enthusiastic mountain bikers. He's one of hundreds of thousands of people that come here to soak up the spectacular scenery while hiking, biking, or climbing. What do you call this? For a couch. Yoho is a very special park. We have got magnificent backcountry hiking opportunities. We've got really great front country opportunities. Located on the continental divide on the western slopes of Canada's Rocky Mountains, Yoho National Park is just 1,300 square kilometers. But within its boundaries are 30 peaks over 10,000 feet high. Formed on the same day as Glacier National Park to the east, Yoho is the second oldest in the national park system. Its long history is directly tied to the history of the Canadian Pacific Railway. In 1871, British Columbia agreed to join the Confederation of Canada as long as there was some kind of link to the rest of Canada, which was in the east at that time, and they agreed that there would be a transcontinental railway built. And for some unknown reason, Kicking Horse Pass was chosen as the route for the Canadian Pacific Railway, probably the steepest, the most challenging, and the most dangerous pass out of all of their options that they could have chosen. To help pay for the construction of the railway, Canadian Pacific built a hotel in the town of Field and marketed the Kicking Horse Valley as an alpine destination for tourists. The first luxury hotel that CP built was built in Field Mount Stephen House. They really focused on bringing elegant tourism to the Rocky Mountains. They were looking for ways that they could make money and they said tourism. This is the Alps of Canada.
Besides mountaineers and luxury tourists, Canadian Pacific also tried to draw anglers to the park. But the railway's decision to stock the park's lakes with fish species from the east has left today's aquatic ecologists with a problem on their hands. When Canadian Pacific first got here, one of the things that they thought would bring people was improved fishing opportunities. Our thinking about that's really changed. Up until the 70s, we stopped quite actively. We introduced a lot of species that don't belong in Western Canada at all. One of the fish that we stocked the most and that's actually become the most successful is Eastern Brook Trout, and they're from Eastern Canada. And this valley is just um, exactly what's happening all over the park and all over the west. Um, the brook trout can get introduced into an ecosystem, and in a very short amount of time, they just reproduce incredibly, and they squish out all the other fish that are here, they just take over. Aquatic specialist Shelley Humphreys and her team are leading the effort to re-establish native species of fish in Yoho National Park. No, I didn't see any. Just gonna put your bolts up to four. Oh, here's one. I saw one, did I get it? To tackle the problem, her team is taking an entirely novel approach. And we're just trying to figure out the quality of the genetics up here in this location. So we're backpack electrofishing. Allie's got the backpack electrofisher on and it introduces a weak electrical current into the water. We're using about 400 volts today because the water is really low conductivity. It will temporarily stun the fish and give us a quick chance to, to net it, hopefully. I got one! Right. Oh, there's another one, Marcel, too! Did you get it? After the ecologists have caught enough fish for the survey, they take them to shore for closer <laughs> examination. two, three, four, five, six, seven cutthroat trout. They're in here. And uh, we're gonna put some anesthetic in this bucket here. We use clove oil. And we're going to gently induce some anesthesia so that they're not conscious and they're not in pain. Um, after they're out, we will weigh them and measure them. And we'll take a tiny piece of a fin off of them for DNA analysis. So it's just this little piece of fin here. After a full summer of compiling information on the genetic makeup of the trout that populate Yoho's lakes, aquatic biologists have reason to be concerned. The story is a little bit sad. Uh, in the lower part of the park where the cutthroat belong historically, we don't have any left. Um, mostly brook trout have taken over those locations. Um, but in a few selected valleys, like the Lake Pohara Valley up here, we still have a little, a little stronghold. And it's our hope that one day we can use the fish that are up here to try to restore some other locations and use these as a, as a bit of a brood stock. Tending to the cutthroat trout population isn't the only problem Parks Canada staff have to tackle as a result of Yoho's long history of resource management. Decades of fire suppression combined with a warming trend have led to outbreaks of the native mountain pine beetle. With acres upon acres of dead woods surrounding the town of Field, Park fire specialists are preparing for a dramatic response.
From the sky, the damage the pine beetle has done to the pine forests of Yoho National Park is evident. On the ground, the telltale signs of the pine beetle infestation are much more subtle. These are pitch tubes on this mature lodgepole pine, and it's part of the evidence that tells us that it was indeed killed by mountain pine beetle. And the mature beetles go in here, um, they burrow under um, meat and lay eggs, and then the next spring, early summer, uh, the eggs hatch and the next cycle of mountain pine beetle comes out and flies off and infects other trees. Parks Canada fire specialist Rick Kubian believes that old forest management strategies may have something to do with the pine beetle outbreak. Fire management's come a long ways in the last 20 years where we've really grown to understand that fire is a key disturbance in many of these ecosystems. It occurred with relative regularity, say every 80 to 120 years on average. And probably what we've done is skewed the system towards uh, fewer, larger wildfires that only occur on the hot and dry years. So our job is to try and get some fire back into the system. Today, Parks Canada researchers are making last minute preparations for an enormous prescribed burn. They plan to torch an area of forest 2,100 hectares in size in order to help fight the pine beetle problem. Researchers install monitoring devices that will help them understand how the fire moves through the forest after it is lit. What we're going to do here is put in um, something called a thermocouple. And what it does, essentially, is measures temperature over time. So the objective here is that we want to measure the temperature and the timing at which um, the fire front passes. Using some basic trigonometry, we're able to figure out how quickly the fire moves through these plots and therefore establish rate of spread. Thermal sensors aren't the only tools fire managers will use to monitor the burn. Another piece of the puzzle that we've uh, used a few times is uh, something called an instand camera. And so this is a piece of equipment that's housed, uh, it's essentially a video camera housed in an aluminum box surrounded by ice that actually stays within the fire and allows us to anecdotally understand fire behavior. We'll actually place uh, a camera over here uh, looking across slope towards you and one in behind you looking across slope at the other camera. And so what that'll enable us to do is actually see the fire behavior and be able to um, use that information to help us guide our understanding of the fire behavior that we gather from the instrumentation. With monitoring equipment in place, fire managers wait for the right weather to set the forest ablaze. The plan is that we're going to light a strip ignition and given the slope, um, the fuel loads, should enable uh, an upward spreading crown fire through this forest, which would come through here uh, fairly quickly, probably moving at 20 to 30 meters a minute. Um, it will be active in the full crowns. And so this burn, we've carefully planned this over approximately four years. And the actual ignition of this burn, there will be nobody on site. It will be ignited remotely by a helicopter using something called a heli torch. On September 11, 2011, backwoods trails near Otter Tail River are closed to hikers and backwoods campers. A day later, the fire is ignited. Flames sweep across acres of forest while engineers monitor the fire from a mountaintop across the valley. The otter-tailed prescribed burn goes off without a hitch, renewing a large patch of the park's forests for future generations.
in national parks, we're thinking bigger than just the humans that are here. We're thinking about the forests, we're thinking about the aquatics, we're thinking about the animals that live here too. It's a big juggling and balancing act. We need our visitors and our visitors need the national parks, but we also have to manage so that other species can thrive. But managing Yoho's unique ecosystems is just one of the responsibilities of park management here. As one of Canada's mountain parks, visitor safety is also a fundamental concern that park managers must account for. Because when something goes wrong for hikers in Yoho National Park, it often goes drastically wrong. People are scared, they're cold, they're miserable, they just want to get out of there, and they take instructions quite well. It's, it's quite serious, and it's life and death. Two climbers are in trouble on a narrow ridge in Yoho National Park. A group of two were out climbing on uh, Mount Good Sur, the, the south peak. It's a high peak, just, just under 12,000 feet. They, uh, they were climbing up and uh, they got to a point high, high enough that they didn't feel good going up, and they didn't feel good going down. Parks Canada dispatches rescue helicopters to the ridge to find the climbers and to rescue them. When the hikers are spotted, rescuers spring into action. Get over here! Get over here! Helicopter picks up, and he basically slings the uh, rescuer underneath and uh, there's radio communication between the rescuer and the pilot. In this case, uh, the rescuer didn't get off the line because it was so high up, didn't want to get stranded up there whatsoever. So essentially he comes in, the two people are already in harnesses. So he just comes in, checks it out, puts one person in, puts the other person in, contacts the pilot and says, hey, I've got everybody ready to go. He picks up and flies away, the three people on the end of the line. The Mount Good Sur Rescue is the highest altitude helicopter rescue in the park's history. As one of Canada's mountain parks, a big part of managing Yoho National Park is about encouraging visitors to be safe in their excursions into the park. The branches that have been chewed off. Yoho National Park offers a lot of experiences for people who are looking for a little bit of adventure that's an introduction to the natural world. And it also has got experiences for people who want something a little bit more adventurous, some mountain climbing, some mountaineering. Throughout Yoho National Park, there are dozens of opportunities to scale tremendous mountain peaks, each one catering to a different caliber of climber. Some take on the trails for the adventure, others for the exercise, the fresh air, and for the spectacular vistas. But Mount Wapta, among Yoho's many peaks, draws visitors for an entirely unique reason. So have you guys found any fossils? Yeah. Did you find some fossils? Yeah, once you start looking at it. Some can be pretty tiny. Some can be pretty big, too. I mean, you look at, like, look yeah, at this. Like that. That's Olenoides, cool. that's, that's a pretty. trilobite with lots of spines. And, uh, you know, that's one of our bigger uh, most common that you find around up here are trilobites. 
Amidst piles of shale on a lonely peak in Yoho National Park are some of the world's most important fossils. Paleontologists from around the world come here to explore the Burgess Shale. This area has been designated a World Heritage Site because it is the place in the world that the most number of species have been discovered, over 200 different species, over 505 million years old. These animals, they were soft-bodied creatures and that they were fossilized and so exquisitely fossilized to show the detail of the animals from back then. 95% of all animals on Earth trace their ancestry back to the Burgess Shale animals. The fossils of the Burgess Shale have been studied for nearly 100 years. But questions still remain unanswered about why the fossils were preserved here, of all places, and what they mean to our understanding of evolution. Just last summer, there was an animal described by the Royal Ontario Museum from a fossil from here. Uh, that was, is now considered to be the oldest relative of squid. They never thought squid were that old. So it's pretty exciting. That's what's cool about the British Shale too, is it's constantly changing with new research methods, uh, new descriptions of animals. It's, it's not stagnant. It's, there's always something new, new finds, new descriptions, and new redescriptions with new research methods. Paleontologists are constantly reinterpreting understandings of the Burgess Shale. In a similar fashion, Parks Canada is continually learning more about how parks should be effectively managed for future generations. At Yoho National Park, Park management must grapple with the legacy of more than a hundred years of differing management strategies. With an evolving understanding of ecological processes, specialists are caring for the forests and the lakes of the park in entirely new ways in order to keep them healthy for centuries to come. We have to learn to use the parks in a way that are still going to allow my great-grandchildren or your great-grandchildren to come here and be able to hike the trails, to be able to canoe on Emerald Lake, to have those experience, experience the serenity, all of the rejuvenating powers of nature. Woo! We're still on a bit of a downhill. We have a really important role to play for Canadians. This is really, this sort of mountain wilderness is really a part of our cultural landscape. And we really want people to stay connected with nature. It's so beautiful and it's such an important part about what the country is about. People have experiences that are humbling. They have experiences that, that uh, may be a catalyst for something else in their life when they realize that they can get out and do this this beauty and experience nature. And it can be definitely life-changing for people in a good way. I'm pretty much famous now. The farthest corner of North America is a barren wilderness. We could be the first people, and certainly in modern times, to be, to be in this exact location. Very few people have ever made it this far north. It's a land totally to be further understood. Very little is known about this land. But there are many clues that this land hasn't always been empty. You're seeing the skull of a of a human being that was around 
God knows when, eh? The Inavaluit people have found the remains of their ancestors here. In a relatively small area, the density of archaeological features is unbelievable. But with no facilities here to support researchers or visitors, Parks Canada and their Inuvaluit partners are starting from scratch. It's a vast landscape. It's one in which these, these amazing rivers flow down, and they've flown down since time immemorial through this ancient, ancient land. It's an area which we now know. People long ago have lived here once. We, we know very little about them. They're, they're like a mystery. It's a place you can walk for 10 days along these amazing canyons. You know, it's a place like the skies. Clear and open. Tuktut Nogait National Park covers 18,000 square kilometers. It's located in an isolated corner of the Northwest Territories. The agreement that led to the formation of the park is unique in the history of Parks Canada. The Inavaluit people themselves initiated negotiations to establish a national park. The Inuvaluit have been historically dependent on the Blue Nose West Caribou and elders have reflected on times that caribou have been scarce on the land. Although the Blue Nose West herd has numbered well over 100,000 animals in the past, recent surveys indicate the herd population is less than 20,000 animals. In 1998, Tuktut Nogai National Park was established to ensure the preservation of the caribou and the land that supports the species. The Nuviaiwit, in proposing this park, two parks Canada wanted to protect it the calving grounds of the most caribou herd. The caribou are essential to the entire ecology of this system. Uh, take away the caribou and the ecology of this, this place would fundamentally change. The park was created to protect not the birthing grounds, but the areas where the young caribou after their birth are, are raised in those first few months. And it's important habitat because when the cows are milking at that very important time, the, the vegetation is in, at the stage where it's particularly nutrient rich, which means the milk for the calves is particularly nutrient rich at that very important stage in their life cycle. Without those nutrients, fewer calves survive, the population doesn't thrive. Monitoring the Blue Nose West Caribou in Tuktut Nogait National Park is a top priority. Parks Canada works with the territorial government to keep track of the health and population of the herd using aerial surveys. But they also use collars with embedded GPS technology to keep track of individual movements and locate large congregations of herds that form during calving periods. Getting close. Should be around here some more. I can see it right there. Oh, OK, there. Today, park ecologists have detected a collar that has become immobile. By following the signal the collar still emits, they try to track it down. Oh, yeah, there's that collar. Oh, caribou been predated. You can see some bear scat here, so it's probably been preyed upon by a bear. Yeah, it was caribou, cow, small vertebrates. Like, didn't look too big. Tell by the jaw, too, is small. Huh? Crush the skull and nose. 
And there's bone scatter all over. It's part of the shoulder and the rib cage. This device that sort of automatically detaches the collar from the caribou. The, the intent is because this is this is this is snug around the neck of the caribou, and as the caribou grows, obviously we don't want the caribou to be to be suffocated. So after a certain period of time, uh, enough time to get data from it, but not too much time, such that this starts to to strangle the animal. It pops off automatically with a signal from the from the satellite. We were either going to find this on its own or find it um, and some remains of caribou, which and then clearly some some remains of some evidence of grizzly bear. So. This was uh, an animal that was predated upon by a grizzly bear, and here's the collar. From data broadcast from the collars to a satellite, ecologists have been able to learn more about the calving grounds of the blue nosed west caribou and the herd's movement across the tundra. Understanding the movement patterns of the species is key to learning more about what factors may influence population fluctuations. The population of the blue-nosed west caribou herd is important to the Inuvialuit because it provides sustenance for the community of Polituk. It's both an important real-life source of food for the people today, but it's also culturally very important because it's been part of their life for many, many, many generations. Since the establishment of Tuktut Nogait National Park, the Blue Nose West caribou population has remained stable, but it has not rebounded. It's a fact that troubles Parks Canada ecologists. Just paying respect to the spirit of the caribou, Just thinking in my head, saying a little prayer for them and hope the population rebounds. We're monitoring their health, monitoring the landscape so we can understand why there might be changes in population. Are the seasons changing such that when the calves are born, the quality of the mother's milk is less because its green up has happened earlier? Are there connections between what's happening in the landscape or is it, is it part of a regular sort of change that's happened in the past? Because the communities have told us that in the past the populations have declined precipitously and then come back. And we, we just don't have an understanding of what's going on. One of the major factors limiting research on the Blue Nose West caribou population is the lack of facilities in the park. It's a frontline problem park managers are trying to solve. The park is, as I've mentioned, 18,000 square kilometers in size, and it doesn't have a single facility in that 18,000 square kilometers. And that's one of the reasons we've come to the park this summer is to talk about potential locations for a facility. And that could be a landing site? Absolutely. Plus a walk up to the ridge type mm -hmm. site for that type of visitor, yeah. The landing strip could support those who are canoeing down the Hornaday River. If we do that, though, it's going to have to be within portaging distance of somewhere we come off the river, whether it be this lake or somewhere on the Hornaday River. Is it, if we if we say that the land Tom is... Nesbitt works with Inavaluit community members to solve one of Tuktut Nogait National Park's biggest problems. Access to the park is only possible by seaplane or a two to three day hike from the nearby town of Paulitov. Consequently, an average of only eight people have been able to visit the park per year. It means thousands of people are unable to experience the mystique of Tuk Tuk Nogait National Park. If you wanted to experience a wilderness for extensive length of time and to be able to walk without any necessary direction or be able to explore as you choose, this is the ideal place to come. And, and you come in the summertime, you've got 24 hours of light, you've got great field of view because there aren't any tree lines that you have to worry about. You've got, you know, you can see for, for many tens of kilometers uh, in any given direction.
The open plains of Tuktut Nogait National Park offer fantastic opportunities for hikers. But the park could be a draw for avid paddlers as well. You have to fly into the southern parts of the park, which are now in the Sotu Settlement area. And from there, you can canoe all the way down uh, the, what's called the Little Hornaday River, and thence the Hornaday River to right here, the Arsenic Lake. That would take you uh, better part of eight or nine days. Uh, you'll see uh, that constantly changing landscape of uh, hills and sand dunes and even small trees in the middle of the, of the river. An adventure in Tuktut Nogait is an experience of a lifetime. But at the moment, only the most dedicated of wilderness travelers can camp here. Currently, there are no facilities in Tuktuk Nogait whatsoever. Together with the Inavaluit community, Parks Canada is trying to find a location in the park for a landing strip to make traveling to the park a little bit easier. We need aircraft to get in here because usually when we're doing research, we're bringing in equipment. We're bringing food supplies that are sufficient for 10 days, two weeks. Right now, air access is only possible with the Twin Otter on floats. That means that the planes that come in have, have less capacity, less payload capacity, because those floats take up a, a fair amount of weight. And, and therefore, it costs, and it costs more money for people to come in. So if we, can get, if we can find landing strips where people can fly in with planes on wheels, they can bring in more people, more equipment, and it doesn't cost so much. But a landing strip isn't all the park needs to improve access. Park managers also aim to build a multi-use facility that can accommodate those that visit and conduct research in the park. When we're talking about a facility, we're talking about something very simple. And we're, we're not planning something that just is, is designed just to facilitate a, a visitor experience, but it's also meant to support monitoring either by Parks Canada folks or third-party researchers. In that sense, we're thinking a facility that can serve as an emergency shelter if someone's in distress. Negotiating the construction of park facilities within the framework of the Tuktuk Nogait Agreement requires conversation and consensus. This national park is, I think, one of three in Canada which are operating truly by consensus using this aboriginal concept of consensus where every, everyone in, is given an opportunity to speak, uh, given space to speak. Let me make a suggestion is that what's, we need to decide what the most important part of this whole thing is right now. If it's the facility, then everything else comes with it, whether it's float plane base or landing base. If it's the landing facility, then you've got to look at where you put the facility based on where that landing strip is or landing place is. I just want the facility to be feasible, that's all. Well, that's, the, that's what I'm saying, is that what do we put first, right? Mm. Well, it might come to that. With limited funding, not all of the desires of park managers can be immediately met. Deciding how to make the necessary compromises isn't always easy. I think that this concept of cooperative management, if properly understood, is a way for Parks Canada to work in real cooperation uh, with Aboriginal yeah. authorities or Aboriginal peoples throughout Canada. That's what's working here. It's working in a place called Sayuadacho, south of here, and it's working in uh, Guayanas National Park in Haida Gwaii. Um, that's a model, I think, for really strong um, relationships between Aboriginal peoples and uh, and yeah, Parks Canada. Do it with an ATV, but that's really not an attractive option. With a landing strip and a support building in place, Parks Canada can hope for a rise in visitorship to Tuk Tuk No Guide. More facilities could also support additional researchers to investigate the falling blue-nosed west caribou population. 
But there are other questions in the park that need answering, too. You're seeing the skull of a, of a human being that was around God knows when, eh? Who were they? We know virtually nothing about where they come from, uh, what did he die of, who are these people? Right from here, you could see the white thing. That's the part of the skull, the skull. On a hike across the tundra of Tuk Tut Nogaiden National Park, a team of Parks Canada guides and Inavaluit elders make an archeological discovery. There's two of them. There's another grave site right behind you. And Tom, you said there's a couple more, eh? right? The, the two originals that we found. This is a, a new site. This is a new site, yeah. Archaeological investigation of Tuk Tut Nogai has only just begun. Much is left to learn about the people that once lived off of this land. Before the 1900s, in the Mackenzie Delta, when a person died, they buried all, all his hunting implements with him. Anything that he owned, they buried it with him. We've heard stories from our elders that these were small people, strong people, and to have them this far inland, it shows you that uh, they, they did come inland to hunt, to harvest. With each discovery, another part of the story of the human history of Tuk Tut Nogai is revealed. When this park was first established in 1996, we thought that there was nothing out here. This was desolate. But it's not true now with all the uh, artifacts and uh, the historical sites, the sod houses, the tent rings and whatnot. So there's over 500 uh, sites now recorded in Tuk Tut Nogait. Burial sites aren't the only remnants of this long past time that archaeologists are finding. They've also discovered dozens of ancient food caches along the banks of the Hornaday River. I'm standing uh, just in front of uh, two caches. The word cache essentially just means uh, material that you um, uh, leave in one place and that you're going to return to uh, at a later date. They would be used to, um, to hold food, um, usually from uh, the late fall into the, uh, uh, the uh, early spring. This is a really interesting cache here. It's been opened. You can see that they've uh, moved the top stones away um, and, uh, and built it up fairly high. So there must have been a fair amount of material that they deposited inside. They were probably traveling down the Horn today and uh, would have been hunting uh, on the range of animals that would have been in the park, but uh, primarily caribou. Archaeologists are in the very early stages of interpreting the remnants of ancient settlements found in Tuk Tuk Nogaid. Today, they use GPS technology to help them map out the layout and distribution of food caches throughout the park. It's really unbelievable, you know, to have such a huge expanse that relatively unexplored by, by uh, other archaeologists. And, and uh, you know, we're finding new things all the time, and that's, you know, really, really exciting. And we're not finding ephemeral evidence of of past people, we're finding, you know, major, major uh, features and, and uh, uh, caches and tent rings, and you know, people were, were, you know, spending a lot of a lot of time here, and and we're one of the first, you know, one of the first explorers in a sense, you know. So it's just really, 
really unbelievably exciting. We do have a lot of places to investigate. Parks Canada's done inventory and found roughly 350 sites throughout the park. Now we, with the elders' permission in Politic, we want to further investigate those, uh, those sites to really find the story of the land and the people upon the land stretching back as far as we can. Very little is known about this land, as opposed to some other places where much, they've been much more studied, right? So here I would think archaeologists or an archaeology professor could have a whole cadre of PhD students working on this and breaking new ground at every step. Your imagination would be the limit, really, in terms of what you did. The isolation of Tuktut Nogait National Park has left much of the landscape untouched. For archaeologists, this means there are hundreds of sites out there yet to be discovered and interpreted. For visitors, it means a trip to Tuk Tuk Nogait is an opportunity to experience the quiet mystique of the far north in an undisturbed setting. I think many Canadians want to protect special natural places. They're part of our heritage, it's part of who we are. And so these national parks, like this one, which are cooperatively run, allow us to protect this natural heritage of all Canadians and to have a strong relationship and a, and a, a healthy relationship um, but of, of Canadians to the land. But to me, those are important investments on the part of the government of Canada in the well-being of Canadians.